So good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Again, thank you for being with us. Um, today I'm reporting to you that we have diagnosed an additional 657, 657 cases of COVID-19 through the Irish laboratories uh, and a total of 411, 411 through the German uh, contract arrangements that have been in place that I've been telling you about in the last uh, week or 10 days, bringing the total number now in this country to 12,547, 12,547 uh, cases of COVID-19. Uh, there have been notified to us by the HPSC an additional 38 deaths, uh, bringing the total number now uh, associated with COVID-19 to 444. 284 of those, or 64%, occurred in hospital setting. Uh, 43 of them occurred in intensive care unit, that's 10%. The male female breakdown is 262 were male, 182 were female, that's 59 to 41%. The median age is 82, and the mean is 69, and the range of ages is from 23 to 105. And we've been, we have been informed that in 84% of cases there is an underlying condition. I understand there was a question yesterday for a further breakdown in relation to that, which I don't have at this moment, but we will work to try and get that for you. Uh, in terms of deaths the, of the 38 uh, that we're reporting additional today, 29 of them are in the east of the country, 6 in the west, and 3 in the south. Uh, 22 of them are male, and 16 were female, and the median age among those was 84, and of those 38, we were informed that 28 have an underlying medical condition. In terms of 285 admissions to intensive care, 158, a further small drop, are currently in intensive care. We've seen 84 people now discharged from intensive care, that's 29%. I've told you that 43 people have died in intensive care units, that's 15% of all ICU admissions. The median age for the intensive care unit admissions is 61, and in respect of those, 285, 81% of them, we've been informed, have an underlying medical condition. That's 230. In the more detailed breakdown of cases notified to midnight the night before last, midnight on Monday of this week, there were 11,261 cases, 1,968, 1,968 of which uh, were hospitalized at some point. That's 17.5%. 280 of them were admitted to an intensive care unit. That's 2.5%. Uh, 435 of them died, that's a, a, a mortality of 3.9%. There are 413 clusters among those, uh, accounting for t t just over 2,024 cases, uh, and 25.5% of each of these cases is in a healthcare worker, and the mean age of those incident cases is 48, median age, I should say, apologies. Uh, in respect of 250 clusters now notified in residential and community settings, uh, 159 of those are in respect of nursing homes. Uh, we, we've been informed by the public health teams that there are 290 deaths associated with those, perhaps not all of them at this moment in time. We have certainty our, our lab confirmed, but those are the deaths that have been notified as associated with those clusters by our public health teams. Uh, and 245 of those 290 are in nursing homes. Uh, and just to remind you, that's provisional, and we give you that information as it becomes available to you, uh, recognising that's a different source of reporting than we would normally give you uh, in terms of the figure that I gave you of, of 444 four, four as the total number. So we're happy to take any questions that you might have. Dr. Hoolan, uh, Rory Carroll from Virgin Media Rory. News. Over 800 cases yesterday, over 1,000 today. I think the middle of April, April was predicted to be the peak. Are we at that stage now? And just in relation to the deaths, are the deaths from the last 24 hours, are they new or are they cases that came from the German lab and there would have been a, a lag there, if you know what I mean? So uh, just to take your second question first, the deaths, the, the additional 41 and just a look of those, they happened over a number of days. Uh, most of them would have happened in the last four, or at least been notified to us in the last four or five days as having occurred in that time period and some are, are a little older, not necessarily in the, in, in the time period of the, uh, the German cases and we don't think they're related to, to that at all. Uh, in terms of the, the other question, um, in terms of what this means for the disease, we'll, we'll have a de more detailed picture of that for you tomorrow evening, but we think this is more an, the increase in testing that we've been doing. Because we've kept an eye on the positivity rate over the course of the, the week. In other words, the percentage of cases that are positive um, out of all of the samples that are done, and it stayed pretty constant. 
So as we've increased the number of tests, we've got a proportionate increase in the number of cases identified disease. We've seen consistently now in, in recent days a significant drop in the number of referrals coming from primary care or general practice of people for testing. Uh, and many of the tests that we see now being positive are likely to come from the kind of institutional settings that we've highlighted where we have a challenge, nursing homes, uh, hospitals obviously in a, on a continuing basis uh, and the priority groups who are being tested like healthcare workers. Marie? Okay. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Hulan, just wondering, um, as I, one looks at these figures, uh, as you say, some of the, the admissions to ICU and the numbers in ICU are quite positive because it's a little bit of a decrease. One wonders about the next step, and um, in relation to the next step, one of the things obviously is testing, and on testing, it appears that some of the labs don't have enough work. So I'm wondering whether or not we're you're considering or at the point of relaxing some of the priorities or the criteria for testing? And is that one of the issues that you'd be looking at over the next couple of days? You're absolutely right, George. It is one of the issues we will be looking at. Uh, I don't anticipate we'll be doing that this week. Uh, I think the focus for now is to build, and uh, you're right in identifying it, our testing capacity, our contact tracing capacity, our sampling capacity, and to strengthen the information systems that are in place in the HSE to allow for the kind of real-time reporting. So we've been very clear all along what we need to have in place for public health reasons by way of a sampling, testing, contact tracing, information regime to allow us to say that we have the maximum chance of detecting cases, that we can put in place infection prevention and control arrangements when we do identify them, we can contact trace those individuals, sample those people who are identified as close contacts and place into, as it were, active surveillance any of those contacts that we identify. That's the kind of regime we have in, uh, to have in place. And there's intensive work happening right now in the HSE around that. As we, be, as we get more uh, confident that we have the, the arrangements of that kind in place in the way that we need, uh, we, will, we will then, assuming that the pattern with the disease uh, gives us um, uh, assurance that it's the right time for us to do so, we'll seek to, to change the case definition. All other things being equal, that's something I think we'd expect to be doing next week, because I have said to you uh, all along that if we are to uh, consider um, uh, in advance of the 5th of May changing any of the restrictions that are in place, we'll want to have had that more sensitive case definition in operation for a period of time, so we're able to see what the impact of that is. And so when we build our testing and contact tracing and sampling capacity, we'll want to see what it's like in practice when we change the case definition and, and to have some experience of that before we get to the 5th of May. Okay, thank you. And in terms of the modeling, obviously it's an ongoing thing yes, and you have more and more information all the time. Mm -hmm. are, you, are we likely to get an update in relation to modeling soon? So uh, very soon. We'll have Philip Nolan with us tomorrow evening to provide that. So I hope that on an ongoing basis we should be able to, subject to Philip's availability, of course, uh, be in a position to give you that update each Thursday and to give you the best sense that we have of that. Brilliant. And I just see uh, Dr. Siobhan Ivrine here. Yeah. And could I just ask you, Dr. Siobhan, because so frequently we don't actually get to the point of what a, a new character on the, the team would say. What point would you like us to take out of what you want to say this evening? Um, I suppose the most important thing I'd like to say <clears throat> is that this is a difficult time for families and for staff and that we have assistance programs there to help people and that we're very conscious of how hard our staff are working. And I really want to reiterate the message very strongly to them to look after themselves so they can look, af look after their patients. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, George. Good evening, sure. Michelle Hennessy from the Journal. Uh, there were a few reports today about, in particular, the over 70s groups and, and how difficult that they're finding the isolation at the moment. Um, also, the Department of Health has said that cocooning is not mandatory, which I think we all knew. Um, but over 70s are wondering why can't they even go out for a walk, a daily walk? So what's the risk there? What's the risk level if somebody who's over 70 who's otherwise fit and healthy goes out for, for a daily walk? Uh, so if I might just take part of that question, and perhaps Dr. Nibirin will, will, will want to supplement what I'm, I'm going to say. Uh, so our clear recommendation is for people who are over the age of 70 um, to, to, to remain at home uh, for the reasons we've said and to avoid leaving home except for those very essential reasons that we, uh, we have identified. I can understand how challenging that is and how frustrating that is. Many people over the, over the age of 70 are fit and healthy and probably had a pre-existing uh, uh, lifestyle of active exercise, active participation in society. So it's particularly challenging for, for people in, in, in those age groups and in those circumstances. Um, the reality is we know that the risk of this infection uh, having 
a greater impact on an individual is greater by virtue of your age, almost independent of whether you have an underlying medical condition or not. So somebody who's older has a greater risk of having a more complicated experience with this infection if they pick it up. And we think that we can't uh, uh, give advice to people that it's time for them to, uh, that it's appropriate for them to come back out and to come to an end of the period of cocooning until we think that we have sufficient control in the community generally in relation to this disease. We don't think we're at that point yet. And while we think we're making continued progress in that direction, we think we're not there just at this moment in time. We won't want to continue an arrangement like this or a recommendation like this, given how challenging it is for people any longer than, in, than, we, think it's, than we think is necessary. Um, but we think we're not at that point yet. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll give a further update, if you like, in terms of where we think the progression of the disease is uh, um, uh, tomorrow evening that might give some kind of a sense of where we think we may be as we approach the 5th of May. Okay. And if I Siobhan? could just add yeah. to that, yeah. I think it's very important to add to that while we're continuing with the social distancing measures, it's very important that people don't ignore any health systems, the, any health problems they do have, that our general practitioners and our emergency departments are open for business, albeit quite quiet. We've also put systems in place so that if people do attend their emergency departments, we're trying to separate them out from COVID and non-COVID patients as much as possible. So please don't ignore any serious health problems that you have. Do contact your doctor, and if needs be, do contact the National Ambulance Service to go to emergency departments. And just one more from me um, on the topic of misinformation. I know you've been saying all along people should go to official sources to, to get their information, but there are people who are trying to switch off a bit from the news so they're not overwhelmed by the negativity of it. It's more difficult to do that when it comes to their family WhatsApp groups, their friends WhatsApp groups, things that are just being popped into them. There's one that's been circulated in the last 24 hours. Uh, I won't read the whole thing, but it basically has um, opening dates, a tentative calendar managed by the government, and it has a list of dates, uh, including 12th of May, small businesses, um, 25th of May, personal services, bars on the 1st of June, hotels on the 7th, sports and shows on the 23rd of June. Can you just clarify for us that that's false and that that list doesn't exist at the moment? And also that if a list like this was to be compiled, how that would work for, from your perspective, the advice would come from NEFIT and what would follow on? Uh, so that's false. Uh, no such list exists. Um, so that's just not authentic. People should ignore it. Uh, what we will do is give consideration, and we're doing that work literally as we speak, to what those measures might be. Uh, it's not so much a hypothetical circumstance, but a set of circumstances that has not yet arisen. So I, I want to continue to emphasize that all of the social distancing and other measures that we recommend across society are still in place, and it's still very important that people uh, continue to, uh, to observe them. Uh, any sense of complacency, there's no room for, we're not at the point where we think we can start to, uh, to recommend to people that, 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 that we need to start thinking about changing some of these measures. But in preparatory terms, we're making plans along those lines for when the time would be right. Um, and we will, uh, we, we will make those assessments, obviously, on public health grounds. We'll work with our colleagues across other government departments. Because we'll want to also understand uh, what both the economic and social impact uh, is of some of those. So it will not be the case that we, uh, we recommend for relaxation the measures in the same order in which we introduce them. Uh, there'll be a very different order that will apply to those measures. Uh, and what we like to do first is to identify those measures where we think the risk of, of increasing the rate of infection is low and where maybe the economic benefit or the social benefit to society is high. Uh, if we can identify those measures first. But we, as we do that, we'll want to be in a position to track what the impact is and whether there's any, any impact in terms of increasing the rate of infection and to pick that up as quickly as possible because even if we model and identify a measure for, for, um, for relaxation, it may well be that we're wrong in terms of the impact that has on the spread of infection and we want to pick it up if we're wrong uh, and it may well be that it leads to other behaviours that we don't intend because uh, um, as, we, as we stepped up through the measures, the public were mostly ahead of us. They were certainly with us and often ahead of us. And so to go back to an example we spoke about, like cocooning, by the time we got to a point of formally recommending cocooning, in reality, many people had already taken that decision themselves. There is a chance that as we begin to introduce some relaxation, that people may think that we're on a path to rapid relaxation and they may start to go ahead of us and start to organize parties and get-togethers and things like that that really would be not what we would intend and might lead to spread of the infection in ways that we wouldn't have predicted. So for those reasons, we really need to be very careful as we step our way through any change in the measures that are in place at the moment and have a, have a very uh, uh, rapid system 
for detecting any increase in the infection in case we have to do something further to, uh, to address that. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. So, David Quinn, Sunday Times. Um, there are growing complaints from the nursing home sector, both in Ireland and in various countries, that compared to the hospitals, they've been, in effect, treated as the poor relations um, in terms of getting, for example, personal protective equipment, uh, in terms of testing. Uh, the NHI complained about the difficulty getting a meeting uh, with the Department of Health last month, and it didn't happen until towards the end of the month, and so on. And there was also advice about you know, visitors um, on March 10th, which was delivered by yourself in terms of don't close the nursing homes to visitors yet. So I'm just wondering how you respond to these growing concerns from the nursing uh, home sector, particularly in view of how many have died from that sector. Thank you. So we've seen a pattern in this country which unfortunately has followed patterns in, in, in many other countries where there's been a challenge for these uh, individuals in these settings uh, and in particular these, these institutions that you've identified. Um, we, we have, like other countries, identified that as a priority area. Uh, the work, and we've detailed that over the course of this week, has been ongoing in terms of preparedness for, for many weeks since we began with this, ever before we had cases into this country. Uh, and we stepped up those measures as we identified challenges in that particular sector. The HSE and the Health Information and Quality Authority are working with the nursing homes and with the community settings to try to address those places in particular that have a challenge in terms of clusters at the moment and a range of different measures are in place at this point in time to help to address that sector because that sector is a priority for us. It is the area, if you like, within uh, our population, our society where we have a particular challenge and it's there for a particular focus of our work. We think uh, for the most part we have made significant progress in, in reducing the risk of transmission of this infection in the wider community out in the street and out in communities and so on for, for the reasons that are clear and, and obvious. We've seen that in the disease, but we have a continuing challenge in the nursing home and community settings, and we've set that out. There has been a pattern of mortality and infection in, the, in, in that sector. That, that, that means that we need to redouble our efforts. We need to continue to prioritize, and, and we've said all along that we, are, we continue to be concerned about that. Uh, I'm going to address the specific point that you made in relation to the advice that we gave around nursing homes and visitation uh, because that's been uh, identified in recent days. It's important to, to clarify what we said at that point in time was it's important that the public follows the clear public health advice, that the measures we introduce, we introduce together as a society and at the same time and in a consistent and coherent way. I think in the, at, in the, in the circumstance that you're identifying, there were a number of different measures been taken by different parts of society and different, not on public health grounds. Individual schools were taking decisions to close. Recommendations were being issued by different people around visitation and so on in relation to nursing homes. We were clear that a, a measure to restrict visiting in nursing homes that was too early would mean that we were very likely to have an important measure in prevention of the transmission of the disease introduced for longer than was necessary. And that was the reason that we didn't want to move ahead of what was necessary in terms of the introduction of a recommendation like that. As it happened in short order after that, we saw a change in the behavior of the disease that said, okay, now is the time. But it was one of a series of different measures that we took, all of which were directed at that first set, if you like, of, of measures around schools, around nursing homes and hospital visitation, around universities and so on. That first tier of measures, as we've described them, that we took as a range of coherent things that were based on our public health advice. Because uh, we're clear that the economic and social impact of all of the measures is very significant. Uh, they all depend on the compliance of the public. Uh, if we don't have public buy-in and understanding, we, have no, we, have, we, we, we greatly increase the risk of those measures not being effective. Introducing them too early and keeping them for too long is a way of ensuring that they're then not effective when you need them. And that's the reason that we would have said, now, now is not the time. We need to do these at the right time. And those decisions were made on public health grounds. And those measures are recommended by us at a point in time. And it was important that, that, that we, if you like, provide that lead for the whole of society uh, to respond at the right time. And that's the reason for that. Okay. Perhaps uh, Dr. Levine might want to supplement something in relation to the response around nursing homes and community settings. Well, I think it's important to emphasize, Tony, that it's not just nursing homes we're talking about. We're talking about longer term residential care facilities mm -hmm. in the disability and mental health sector as well. And that we have a range of responses uh, to the nursing home and uh, longer term residential care setting, which includes clinical guidance. It includes support. And certainly there's no question of those institutions 
uh, being in any way a poor relation in terms of PPE. It's being considered, taken very seriously, and we're responding to it with both clinical response, infection control, and occupational health responses. Thank you. So second question, given the number of empty beds which are in the hospitals, because the number of beds occupied by COVID patients hasn't been as big as expected, um, will some effort be made to move some of the more urgent cases from the waiting lists into some of those empty beds? So we've, we've identified this uh, on, on a few occasions here. Mm -hmm. We're concerned that there isn't, as it were, enough activity now happening in hospitals. And although it's beginning to, 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 to creep back up again, uh, we need to start to uh, resume the provision of health services to do exactly the kinds of things that you're mentioning and to say to the general public, as Siobhan had said a moment ago, not to stay at home when there's, a, when there's uh, something that concerns you in terms of your health. You, you should make contact with your, your GP. You should attend an emergency department if you would do so in other circumstances, if you have a concern about symptoms or about an illness that you have. Uh, uh, it, is the, it is the job of the health service to protect you from picking up COVID-19, and the health service is good at doing that. The arrangements that are in place in our hospitals are such that you can have confidence that if you, if you attend for care, for treatment, uh, everything will be done to prevent the spread of this infection to you and you can be reassured that the right thing for you to do is to attend and to respond to any, any, any illness or but any concern should, that you may have. But should doctors actually be actively trying to bring patients in who have been a long time in waiting lists? You know, so instead of the public saying, okay, I've got this sure, condition, no, I, I need to go into a and &E, should doctors actually be actively seeking to bring patients in? So as we start to move back into, a, in, into switching back on, if I can put it that way, elective activity, we need to start with the areas of, of greatest priority first. Mm -hmm. And that's obviously going to be, to be people who, who, have, uh, who are waiting for, for urgent and high priority surgery, and we need to see that activity uh, resuming. Now? Uh, yes, in effect, okay. yes. Okay. Because okay. Like, it's clear that the only health challenge for the health system is not COVID. Mm -hmm. the, the health of the, of the population is still being impacted by all of the things that would have impacted the health of the population at any point in time. We'd be concerned if the behaviour of the, of the public was such as to stay away, or if the operation of the health service, if it had a capacity to provide care for these people, was such as... But, but what you're pointing out, it just gives me the opportunity to say that the experience that we've had with this infection in this country thus far, albeit at the price of the measures that we've had to put in place economically, socially, uh, over the last uh, 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 six or so weeks, um, has, has, has allowed, if you like, that capacity to be protected uh, that you've identified, whether it's in intensive care, whether it's in hospitals generally. Uh, and, and that's good. And it's good because it reflects that the burden of impact of this illness on the public, uh, on the health of the population, has, has in a very significant way been protected uh, by the measures that society has taken. The number of people who have picked up this infection, the number of hospitalizations, the number of admissions to intensive care, and the number of deaths that have occurred, much, much, much lower than many other countries have experienced and than might have been experienced if we didn't have the effective responses at each of the stages that we've, we've asked for from the public and that the public has worked with us to implement. Okay, thank you. Thanks, David. Hi, Tony. Shane Beatty okay. from Newstalk. Um, could you give us an update on the information deaths in private nurses, nursing homes versus public nursing homes? Uh, I don't have that breakdown uh, with me, Shane, and that's one of the kinds of things that we're looking to try and um, uh, provide. So we're, we're, if I can put it this way, digging in deeper and deeper into the kind of information that we have around uh, mortality uh, in not just nursing homes, but in the community set settings in general to try and understand this pattern uh, um, of mortality uh, better than we do at the moment. Uh, we've indicated that we want to see earlier notification of deaths happening. Uh, we'd like to see more testing for COVID in people who are uh, either either have significant health illnesses towards the end of their life or people who have died. And we'll be, we'll be giving guidance in relation to some of those kinds of factors to give ourselves the greatest chance of picking up mortality that we think is associated with this, which is something that's not happening in every country, but it's something we're really anxious to do. But the specific piece of information that you've asked for there, I just don't have it to hand at this moment okay. in time. But once we have it, I'll be happy to share it. Okay, okay. yeah. Um, and um, something that's being shared is this research from Harvard. Um, I don't know if you saw it overnight, that they're saying social distancing could be around to at least 2022. Should we be preparing here? until 2022 to have some form of social distancing? Well, it'll be around for as long as is necessary. Uh, and to say with confidence when the end point of that, uh, I, I think I indicated earlier in the week that we could find ourselves in a situation where a series of measures will need to be in place across the population to keep suppression of this virus at a level 
that we can manage to function as a society, that we can manage to operate our healthcare system, but most importantly, that we can manage for the purpose of protecting the health of people in this country. This is, if we can prevent the spread of this infection and we prevent people from picking it up, we protect them in terms of their health. So that's the primary reason for keeping this infection at the low levels that we've been able to keep it at so far. If we're to continue it, to keep it at that low level, uh, what we'll be looking forward to then is the emergence of, we hope, of a candidate vaccine uh, that can then be manufactured at scale and made available and distributed across the population and for that to happen as quickly as possible. But being realistic, that is going to be a lengthy period of time. And if the rate of infection in the population remains as low as it is and as we intend to keep it, we won't be by definition building up levels of immunity in the population in the way that you would in a vaccination program or in the way in which it might have been proposed in some jurisdictions when herd immunity strategies and so on were being talked about. And just one final one from me. Um, what, what's the Department of Health's view on reinfection? Because I know what has been said that we don't know if, if people build up, as you say, uh, immunity. Are you worried about reinfection and are you worried about people who think that they are now immune because they've been diagnosed with COVID-19? So uh, there have been case reports in the literature of reinfection, um, uh, but we think that there is a good chance that people who have had infection with this disease, that it's likely to confer immunity on them. What we'd like to be is in a position where we're not at the moment to have what we call seroprevalence surveys that give us a good understanding of the background immunity in the population. We have plans in place to roll out those surveys and there's work literally happening at the moment to allow us to have rolling seroprevalence surveys so we can understand the background incidence that, that, that in the population, the levels of immunity in the population. As soon as we get a test that's good enough to recommend, there isn't one yet. We hope to be in a position, uh, I won't give an absolute commitment on Friday, but, but I intend at least at this moment on Friday that we'll be in a position to share with you a very detailed piece of work that we've done on what we call a health technology assessment of all the possible tests that have been uh, developed so far, uh, many of them serological tests and other tests that could add to the kind of testing regime that we have. Uh, I think we'll be the first country in Europe to have completed a piece of work like that. Um, uh, we'll make the detail of it available to you later in the week. So we're watching and waiting for a good test that we can start to use. We have the, we're working on the survey arrangement that would then be in place to allow us to roll out that test. We just haven't got that test yet. But don't assume at the moment if you've... Do not assume that. ...that you're immune. Well, a person who's had the infection, where it's a confirmed infection, we think it's likely that they will have conferred, that, that will confer immunity on that person. I think what the world doesn't know is what the strength of that immunity is and how long it's likely to last. Great. Yeah, Thank thanks, Shane. Um, good evening. Um, you have, NEFIT has uh, expert advisory group and various committees. Do you have a communications group and or do you employ PR professionals to advise you? Uh, so we have a communications group. We have a behaviour uh, uh, group which is looking at not just communications, but, but understanding behaviour and behaviour change and trying to influence, if you like, the kinds of behaviours that we're seeking around uh, um, hand hygiene, respiratory etiquette and around uh, uh, social distancing and so on. We think the work of that group is going to become really important as we move into the phase of lifting restrictions uh, because we think that like, the, the message around um, health behaviours will be much more nuanced, will be much more challenging to get across uh, and we're going to have to, uh, to, 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 to have a lot of experts on board with us to help us with that work. So we already have some people um, from the university and academic se uh, sector, experts in the fields of behavioural economics and so on, working with us in relation to that and we're looking to try and bring in some other companies to help us. But at this moment in time, we don't have, a, did you say PR companies? Well, sorry, do you have a communication subcommittee separate from that behavioural group? So no, we have a communications team here in the department, some of whom are here with us in yeah. the evening, and there's also a communications team in the department, well, or sorry, in the HSE, and they, they are members of the NEFIT. And do you, do you, have you engaged outside advice, be they PR consultants or the like? I, no, I don't believe no. so, unless okay, any, I'm just any of the communications team have sought something that I'm not aware of, but okay. no, I, I don't believe so. Yeah. I don't um, believe so. Um, can, can I ask you, have nursing homes been told? No, no? I'm being told, sorry, to, oh, to, be, to be more clear. <laughs> no, Paul. I should have just asked. <laughs> um, have nursing homes, homes been told not to talk to families about outbreaks in, 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 their, in their homes? Uh, not, that I, not that I'm aware of. I'm aware of one home which has been said that's been instructed by the, what's called the public health emergency team not to 
discuss the number of cases in Well, I can absolutely assure you that if, if, that if, if, any, if anyone's been told that, it did not come from us or in, on, in front of any instruction from here. Okay, that's fair. Um, are you aware, sorry, my questions are a bit diverse. Okay. Are okay. you aware of um, deaths not being reported? Uh, I can imagine that debts might not be reported. Um, no, but are you aware of them not being? I'm not that aware that of any. They mightn't be, but that they haven't been. Uh, I'm not aware of a, of a death, let's say, that I know to be a lab-confirmed one, for example, that I know has not been reported, hmm. which is not quite the same as me saying that I think every single one has been reported. I think it's likely that maybe some have not been reported yet. Uh, as, as, as things stand, the yeah. period of time for notification is a three-month one. So but are you aware of there being a problem about the non-reporting of deaths? Uh, no, I'm not. Okay. And what we're seeking to try and do is, uh, which is so again, not saying the same thing to, that there aren't, that I'm not satisfied that there aren't log jams or other, other problems in that system of reporting. Mm. What we're seeking to do is to try and dig into that so we can free up any challenges that there might be in getting good and accurate reporting of, and as much as we can have it, real time information on the mortality experience of the whole population so that we might be able to see if there is an excess mortality experience happening as a result of this infection of the kind that happens in a flu season each year where you may not pick up very many uh, positive influenza swabs in people who are tested from influenza, but you see every year an excess of deaths um, uh, uh, that usually runs to a number of hundreds and sometimes up to a thousand in, a, in, a, in, a, in an average flu season across the population when you look at the excess deaths in that population over, over the winter period. Right. And sorry, finally, I was asking yesterday about contact tracing. And I'm just wondering, again, thinking about it, are there particular metrics that you have to measure the, the, that will measure the success of, of contact tracing? I was thinking, for example, the time between a positive test and everybody's contacts being traced. You know, it, we've talked about delays in testing and so on, and days that we mentioned. What's the metric for, for, the, for the performance of contact tracing? So, so one of the things we'll have is the, sort of the average and the median time for contact tracing to be completed. And it's one of the things we want to. We don't have information on that at the moment. It's one of the things we're trying to collect from the contact tracing experiences that are going on out in the population. As we move into the new arrangement, we have to have reporting of that kind of information in the way that we don't just have right at this moment in time. And to not only have it reported, but to know that it's happening within an appropriate period of time, which, as I've said all along, uh, is, is real time. And by real time, we mean same day or next day. Is there any reason why we don't have that? Well, I know, I know the HSE is putting in place a system mm. uh, to capture that kind of information and that will be making that information available to us. Uh, and that's part of the work that's happening at the moment, but we don't have that information at this moment in time. Okay. All right, thanks. Thanks, Paul. Um, I know from last week uh, when we first started reporting the German figures, or when we did anyway, which was last Friday, um, at the same time, if many of those... Um, tests had dated from March, presumably then some people have, who those tests were given to have also died. Are those deaths being accounted for in the figures at present? So all deaths, uh, all deaths uh, associated with COVID are accounted for in the figures. That's the first thing to say to you. The second is that I think the vast majority of those cases will be cases that will have occurred uh, because, uh, in, in the community, the community cases. But, uh, sorry, but I mean, if a test hasn't come back from Germany yet and someone has died, how can we know that that's what they died of? And the vast majority of tests have now come back from Germany. I think there might be a small number remaining, but the vast majority have now come back. I think the very final batch, which is a very small number, was going today, is my, is my understanding. So the recent death figures would have included ones, say, from tests from mid yeah, so Yeah, so any of, the recent, any of the figures, including the figure I gave you today, will include any notified deaths that, are, that, that we got. Um, uh, through the HPSC as late as, uh, as, late as yesterday. Um, in terms of false negatives, uh, how prevalent are they? And what is the overriding reason for them? Is it swabs not being taken correctly, or what, what is the, what's the reason for saying? So when you say false negatives... Are well, you I know there's a story recently that the HSC has apologised that up to 100 people had... Uh, sorry, less than 100 people had received an apology because they tested negative when they were positive. And I've heard of two different situations. I, one situation where someone was tested twice and it was negative, and then the third time it was positive. Um, so I'm just wondering, why would false negatives be happening? So they're not false negatives, and Killian de Gascon was here with us yesterday evening, and he set that out clearly uh, um, from his position. 
uh, what he described is that they're not false negatives. They came back as indeterminate. There are technical reasons, which I will say to you, go beyond my expertise. He is a virologist. I am not. That go beyond my capacity to explain around the PCR, the polymerase chain reaction process, which is the, which is the if you like, the chemical, biological process that's used to detect the virus, why it might be indeterminate in some circumstances. Uh, and when it's indeterminate, the usual practice is that a request to be made for a resample. But when the test was done and identified as indeterminate, the case was two, three, four weeks old. Uh, and beyond the point at which it would have been appropriate to seek a further swab, and that was the reason that it wasn't. It's not quite the same as suggesting that there was a false negative that it gave the wrong result. Uh, the individual uh, got, as a result of what he explained to you yesterday evening, told uh, that uh, the test was negative because when the information came back from the lab from Germany, uh, its interface with the laboratory information system in the NVRL identified it as negative which that's where the error occurred. It wasn't a false negative in the testing. It was, a, it was a problem with the computer system in the NVRL and its communication with the German computer system. And he, sp he explained that now far better than I can explain to you yesterday evening. If you were here, you'd have heard I wasn't it. here, I'm afraid. No, you weren't. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, finally, um, what is the earliest? We had an early flu season this time around, didn't we, starting for around October or so? Uh, we usually see flu... Uh, peak in this country, and it's not always the same, you're right, uh, usually after Christmas in the early weeks in January. Um, uh, and we, so the, the levels of flu in the population now, are, the flu season is over for the, for the current winter, and very, very low levels of flu in the population here. Flu as a phenomenon for the winter just passed had ended, for, luckily for us, uh, before this experience began in effect which was not the situation for many other countries across Europe. As coronavirus became a challenge in Italy, for example, they had very high rates of transmission at the same time of flu, which is a real challenge, but we, we were lucky that we didn't have that. Uh, and the rates of flu now in the population are low. Uh, were the season to come again, uh, early again, say later in the year, and uh, we're still dealing with a significant COVID problem, what sort of challenges would that represent? Well, it will create a challenge for us if we have a situation where we're dealing with more than one significant respiratory viral infection at the same time. So one of the things we want to try to do, and we're in planning work in relation to that, is to greatly extend the flu vaccination program and to bring more people into the program to receive flu, to receive flu vaccine than would normally receive it. And to also anticipate and hope that although we've done very well in recent years in increasing the number of healthcare workers who come forward for flu vaccination, that, that as a result of this experience, we'll be able to encourage far greater numbers of our healthcare workers to get vaccinated against flu in the forthcoming season. We're anticipating that, we're planning for that, uh, and we hope that that will be the case. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Hello, uh, Neil Leslie from the Mirror. Uh, I just wanted to ask on the restrictions again. You, you're obviously having ongoing discussions, you've said, uh, detailed discussions about the easing of restrictions if and when that happens. Uh, you've said the order won't be the same as uh, the order in which they were uh, imposed. Can you give people any kind of more detail on specifics of the type of order that you are discussing, the type of things that are likely to be forced up? Is that going to include the over 70s, for instance, the two kilometer restriction? Uh, is there any specifics you can give on the discussions that you're having on that? Again, without being evasive, I'm not going to give detail on that now because that work is literally happening as we speak. We had some discussion about it yesterday at the meeting of the National Public Health Emergency Team. We'll talk about it again on Friday, and I think we'll continue our work on that into next week. We'll be working with other government departments uh, uh, as we do that work to try, as I've said, to identify if we can for early in, the, in, the, in the, the list, if you like, of candidate measures to identify those that have the least impact in terms of health, in terms of increasing the risk of infection, and the greatest benefit in economic and social terms. But I'm not going to set that out now. We haven't completed that work. We haven't had all the discussions around the, the team. I might have my own independent view on that. We'll work on that as a group uh, and come to a set of uh, uh, recommendations that we'll share with government in the first instance, and then we'll communicate them. So you, you can't give any specifics around what the, just what's being discussed as such, no. or even say a measure like that was introduced uh, at one point during the earlier phase of the a limit on the number of people at indoor and outdoor events. Is that something that's even on the table again? It, it didn't seem to be in place for very long at the time. I mean, all, all, the, all of the measures are on the table, uh, and it, like, it seems entirely logical to, to, to imagine a situation. Look, we're more likely to be talking about things uh, that, that have the benefit of, let's say, uh, restoring education, or in as much as we can restoring education, than we are to be turning on 
major mass gatherings in, of, of a social nature. I mean, in broad terms, I think that, that would just stand to reason. But um, say sporting but, uh, events of a, of a more amateur or juvenile nature in terms of know, numbers you're and stuff. You're trying to draw me into... Ah, <laughs> I wonder what's been discussed. But yeah, I mean, those are all the things we're discussing. No, those are all, made, the were, the, all the things that we're discussing. Uh, and when we come into having to making some of these, like as ever with the recommendations that we've been made, that have been rec that we have made, particularly those that have the, the, the significant societal, uh, economic, and social impacts uh, that we've we've introduced over the last number of weeks, they've ultimately been decisions that the government has made, acting on the advice that we've provided uh, to them. The government's entirely free to not act on that advice, to change it, uh, or, 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 or to reject it. Uh, so I'm not going to kind of get ahead of the process, we have to do that work, make the advice available to government. There will ultimately be a decision for government and the communication then of what those measures will be will follow that. We'll very much be following the advice of the WHO and the ECDC who are doing work. There was a meeting today, I think the Minister will have communicated himself uh, on this uh, independently over the course of the day, where he's had engagements with counterparts on a cross-European basis, the Health Security Committee that meets, the ECDC that meets on a continuing basis, all giving consideration to uh, to just this question, what should be the approach to lifting restrictions and I think at particularly the European level, the importance of European countries in as much as possible acting in concert with each other in relation to that, albeit that the disease is occurring at different times in different countries. Um, so we'll be following that advice and that guidance and so when the decisions that come out based on any recommendations that we made, they're not going to be major surprises. I think they're not going to be major variations to the kind of general approach that you'll see in place across uh, many other countries uh, and that you'll see in the recommendations of some of those international organizations. I should also point out, and I've said it I think before, that uh, some countries are ahead of us, particularly at a European level, uh, in Denmark and Austria, a little in the Czech Republic and so on. We'll be watching the experience of disease in those countries really closely over the course of the next week or two to see if, let's say, the predicted effects or maybe some un unanticipated or unintended effects occur and we'll be feeding that into our own thinking uh, before we get to the 5th of May. Uh, just finally, Sorry, uh, Neil. just uh, very quickly on, on nursing homes again, and you've said there's good progress in the community and uh, at that end of things, but less so on nursing homes. I mean, is it, is it fair to say we're losing the battle in nursing homes currently and you know, maybe winning the battle in the community or what would you say to a statement like that? I'm, I'm sure Siobhan might something, but I, I wouldn't put it in those kinds of terms. Okay. Uh, I think we have made progress in relation to the community and we're making progress in relation to nursing homes and, and the community settings in general where we have a particular challenge. But Siobhan, did you want to? And we're developing our responses to that literally as they arise, so I absolutely wouldn't frame it like that at all. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Irene Nulon from Newark TG Cahar. I just have a, a question in relation to Ireland's call. About a month ago, over 70,000 people, former nurses and um, medics, signed up. Um, how many of those people are now um, working in the system, given that we're nearing the peak of this epidemic and there's staffing shortages in nursing homes? How many of, of, of those new recruits are, are actually working on the ground? We're hearing that there's a lot of red tape and not many people at all are, are, are working. Uh, I don't honestly have the direct answers to the questions that you're providing. The HSC has provided that in its, in its press briefings, I think one is, as recent as Monday morning. Uh, of this, if I got my days right, yes, Bank Holiday Monday morning, the HSE did a significant press briefing and they would have set some of that out and, I, and I'm pretty sure that information is readily and easily available to that source. Uh, I think the general point that you're making that the conversion, if you like, of that 70, it hasn't turned into 70,000 extra people working in the health workforce by, by, by any stretch, but there have been important additions to various parts of the workforce as a result of that. And I know that uh, whether it's at the level of regulators or at the level of other parts of the, of, the, of the system, that a lot of effort has been made to try and remove what you might call the red tape impediments to make it as easy as possible for people to, to, to rejoin the workforce, whether that's in terms of fees that might apply in terms of um, uh, uh, re-registration with, with the regulatory body or, or, or any other indemnity or any other impediments. Uh, uh, we've done as, as much as, uh, as possible to try to remove those barriers to make it as easy as possible. I think it would probably be fair to say that if there are still people out there listening and thinking about whether there's a role that they could play, uh, there's still an opportunity. Uh, I'm quite sure that Paul Reid and the people running the health service will say uh, we need as much help as we can get and we'll take as many volunteers and we know that there are parts of the system, particularly around things like contact tracing, where we're pulling on particular groups 
uh, and sectors in terms of voluntary uh, contribution, and we'll need to continue to see that um, um, for the next foreseeable period of time. Thank you. Yes. On that, we've, we have issued contracts, and a lot of that red tape has been cut away. And to add to that as well, the universities have facilitated the rapid um, graduation of our medical students, mm. so they're all starting in May. Mr. Magus. 